So welcome everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in with us this afternoon. Uh, it's a pretty dreary afternoon, depending on where you are in the US. I know it's pretty dreary and rainy here and, and there with Colin too. Um, so thanks so much for joining us today as we talk about endocrinology. This is the third week of our Endocrinology Connect with the Expert Series. And this week we're gonna dive into the topic of height and weight. We've got two wonderful speakers with us. We have Dr. Phil Zeitler, who's an endocrinologist, as well as Colin. Colin Worth, who is a member of our PPMD Adult Advisory Committee. Um, you may remember them from this summer's virtual PPMD annual conference where they talked about this subject then. Um, we heard you loud and clear, PPMD community. You had lots of questions about height and weight and growth in general. And so we're going to take this opportunity today to kind of refresh our memories on this content and then dig a little bit deeper and answer your questions. Um, so as you listen to the presentation and the conversation between Dr. Zeitler and Colin, go ahead, use that chat function, shoot your questions to us. And in the second half of today's uh, time together, we'll go ahead and answer just as many as we possibly can. Um, so with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to our experts, Dr. Phil Zeitler and Colin Wirth. Take it over, guys. Thanks, Rachel. Um, so what we'll do um, is similar to what we did during the virtual conference. Um, I'm going to uh, just provide some background regarding the tools that we use uh, for monitoring height and weight because they're important to this conversation. Um, and then Colin and I are going to have a conversation uh, about his experience. Um, and I think you'll see that Colin's experience uh, with these topics really illustrates a lot of the issues that boys and families um, uh, face uh, in dealing with, with height and growth and, and weight um, in, um, in muscular dystrophy. Uh, so uh, with that, I'm gonna share my screen. So in terms of, um, and, and for those of you who, who attended the previous session on this, I apologize for repeating things, but uh, it, it's really quite important that we understand what what growth is all about. Um, the primary tool that we use for tracking growth um, uh, are growth charts. Um, however, to properly use a growth chart, it means that we have to have a reliable measurement. So the first step in monitoring growth in any child is a reliable, carefully done, reproducible measurement. Uh, and that is done in different ways. Um, for little ones, that is obviously laying down. Um, ideally, that is done with a fixed headboard and a fixed and a, and a movable footboard so that you can actually um, stretch the kid out and get a reliable measurement that's reproducible because it's at full stretch. The problem with anything less than full stretch is that it could be anywhere um, and you can't necessarily get the same number. But when done, done properly, measurements should be able to be reproduced within a fraction of a centimeter. Um, so those are done laying down and it's important to keep in mind that the growth charts for laying down people are actually different than the growth charts for standing up people. So on the left here, this is a, you probably have seen this, a growth chart for birth to 36 months. This is for laying down. And there really is a difference. People are about a quarter of an inch shorter when they're standing up than they are when they're laying down. Um, and that's obviously relevant to um, older, uh, older boys with DMD who are getting measured laying down, right? Um, so there is a difference. Um, just to orient you, um, these are done in percentiles. Uh, what a percentile means um, is out of 100 kids, um, if you're at the fifth percentile, you are taller than five out of 100 kids. If you're at the 95th percentile, you're taller than 95 out of 100 kids. Um, so this goes from zero to 36 months. 
Um, subsequently, kids are measured standing up, um, and that requires a different growth chart. And here in the middle is, whoops, sorry. Here in the middle is a growth chart uh, for a standing person. This goes from two to 20 years of age. So you see that there's actually overlap between the laying down growth chart up to 36 months and the standing growth chart from two to 20. And if you don't chart on the right one, you can actually get abnormalities in growth. Um, what you see here uh, in the last chart is actually a growth velocity chart. And I show this, um, you are probably less used to seeing this, but I show it because it shows you what normal growth patterns look like. So what you see is that at age two, um, kids are growing very, very rapidly. And in the first year of life, kids are growing 10 to 12 inches a year. Um, that gradually falls over time and the lowest growth velocity occurs right before the beginning of puberty, um, which we call prepubertal slowing. Following that, growth velocity rises during puberty and then falls as kids get to be their, their final height. So this pattern um, is very important of uh, rapid growth in the first couple of years, slowing down, sort of plateauing a couple of, uh, by, at around a couple of inches a year um, until the beginning of puberty. All right, the second tool that I wanna show you um, is bone age. Um, and we use bone age as a way to tell us, if you will, the biological age of a, of a, of a kid. Um, and everybody develops differently. Um, the best example of that is uh, the teenage boy that you may remember from middle school who looked much younger than everyone else, um, but then grew after high school and ended up 6'4". Um, we call them late bloomers. Um, and what's happening there is those are people who are developing more slowly. And if you looked at their skeletal age, what you would find is that their skeletal age is younger than their birth age. Um, so the, the skeletal age basically gives us an idea of where in the developmental process uh, a boy is. Um, and what you see here is a one-year-old, a seven-year-old, and a 17-year-old. Um, and using the seven-year-old, you see these little bones here. Uh, these are not two separate bones. That's actually one bone, um, but the space in between hasn't calcified yet, so the x-ray doesn't see it, and that is where the bone grows. Um, those mature over time in predictable fashion that allows us to, if you will, age a bone, the, the hand, and eventually those fuse. And here's a 17-year-old, and you see all of those little bones have now uh, fused together, and there's perhaps a little bit of growth still remaining at the wrist. Um, so this is an important uh, assessment and the effect it has uh, can be shown here. So here we have a young man, um, short. Uh, what I've plotted here is the genetic target. This is what we'd expect this kid to end up, this girl to end up with because her dad is quite tall and mom is tallish, um, tall for a woman. So her expectation is to be pretty tall, but she's growing quite short. However, she actually has, instead of a 14-year-old bone age, shown here on the right, she has an 11-year-old bone age, suggesting that she's developing more slowly. And what you see is if the a bone age of 11 also means they have the growth potential of an 11-year-old. So if you pretend she's 11, now, she, oh, now she's growing exactly where she needed to be. So those are two very important tools. Um, and there's a lot more nuance to that, but that's the, the part you need to know. So we're gonna turn now really to Colin, um, and he's graciously allowed us uh, to look at, um, at his growth chart. Um, so Colin, why don't, you, um, why don't you give folks an overview of, uh, of your growth and, and, and weight gain um, when you were younger? 
Yeah, so um, I, um, I started taking prednisone when I was nine years old. And then um, when I was 15, we decided to see um, Dr. Wong and her team at Cincinnati. Um, and then I decided to switch to, um, or Dr. Wong decided to switch me to Defazacor to help with my weight gain. And um, I also had started on metformin at the same time. Um, as you see here, my weight at its highest was 150 pounds and within a year I was able to bring it down under 130 pounds and um, important note is although I changed steroids and started on metformin um, which definitely seems to have helped um, it's important to note that I also um, made modifications to my diet um, for um, smaller portion sizes and just eating more healthy foods Um, and, and what about, how about your, uh, how about your height, Colin? Um, well, as far as my height, that's definitely a different story. Um, as you can see from the chart, my height was in the 10th percentile after being on steroids for only two years. Um, but then the next two to three years, my height was below normal range. Um, I was on growth hormone for one year from 16 to 17, but um, as you can see, there was no noticeable effect on my height. Um, no, I'd been doing daily injections um, for that whole year. Um, and yeah, and Phil and I had talked. Um, we were thinking that um, because of um, long use of long-term and use of high-dose steroids um, really seems to negate the um, growth hormone treatment. And then it looks like you started on testosterone around the age of 18. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So a couple of points I would make about this growth chart, and then I have some questions for Colin. Um, one thing you notice here is actually that the, the height was actually potentially falling here even before you started the prednisone. Uh, any thoughts, Colin, on, on why that was? Um, yeah, not really sure about that, but I guess, I mean, couldn't that be because of the, um, just having Duchenne? Um, yeah, I mean, one of the things that I think we see pretty universally is um, is is delay in maturation, and so um, I don't have access to it, but it wouldn't surprise me if Colin's bone age was was falling behind at this point, um, so that he, in some sense, was increasingly uh, becoming a late bloomer, which seems to be really common um, in boys with Duchenne's. Although I'm not sure anybody really understands the, the cause of that. Um, but then after starting prednisone, clearly um, Colin's growth gets, gets worse. Um, starts growth hormone. And can you, what was the conversation around starting growth hormone, Colin? What, what did you and your doctors discuss about it? Um, well, I kind of discussed that I um, and wanted to be um, taller, because um, I was definitely um, shorter than the average person. And, yeah, and I think, um, yeah, being in high school too, kind of noticeably smaller than um, other guys my age. <laughs> and And so what you, you and I have talked about this before. What do you think the drive was to be taller uh, and to be more like the other boys your age, even though there were so many aspects of your life that were not like the other boys? Um, yeah, and I think I had come um, 
to realize after that um, year of being on it that it was um, maybe height was not as important as I thought it was. I mean, there is kind of a stigma there about height, but is that really important in the end? Is a um, good point to realize. Yeah, but for a 12 year old or at that point a 15 year old, uh, it feels important, right? Yeah, yeah, just to, um, I mean, just kind of um, parents with guidance to their, their son. Yeah, and I know that's hard to um, just make sure they're thinking long and hard about it and they're not just, um, just thinking real realistically about um, how you get them to understand that um, there's not really a, there's more of a stigma there and it can be also can be helpful being um, shorter in the long run with Duchenne being um, making it easier for transferring and handling by caregivers that mm -hmm. What, what at what age do you think you recognized that maybe it was not such a good idea to be taller? Um, well, <clears throat> well, probably around the time that I had stopped growth hormone, and I think um, being that um, not just myself, but from um, I saw Dr. Rudder at. Um, Cincinnati Children's and yeah I think she was saying is it really necessary and I kind of realized that as well. So here's a question you and I actually haven't talked about yet but in in retrospect which do you think was more important for you the growth hormone or the testosterone? In terms um, of your self-esteem and image. Probably the testosterone. Yeah, that's what I would guess. Yeah. Um, and, and how long were you on testosterone? Um, or do I'm you still, still take it? I'm still taking it. You still it. do, okay, yeah. Um, do you feel like you got any benefits from the growth hormone in terms of strength or stamina or anything, or you just don't remember? Um, not really that I distinctly remember now. And you quit, not just because you realized being tall wasn't a good idea. I think you've told me other things about it that, that led you to want to quit. Yeah, it was also hard to, um, the, um, I did daily injections for growth hormones for a year. So um, just kind of got, got tired, tired of that as well. Yeah, you got tired of it. Especially since you weren't, it doesn't look like you were seeing much response, really, right? Yeah, yeah, there was definitely no noticeable response, as you see, it just continued in a straight line, really. Yeah. That, I think that's right. Um, and likely because of the dose of, I think you're right, likely because of the dose of steroid that you were on. Um, but I think I think you've made some really important points about what's what's the rationale for wanting to be taller. Um, there's there's a huge societal benefit placed on height, and yet the the, the best height for someone depends on their situation. Right, and so it may be that being taller isn't the best thing for somebody, um, right? So I, I think that's a really important point that it's really important to keep in mind the context um, in which these decisions are getting uh, made. Uh, sometimes people ask about whether there are other benefits of growth hormone and there may be um, certainly, we know that growth hormone uh, pr can promote strength and muscle, muscle development and bone density and, and lots of other things in people who are growth hormone deficient. 
that there's some evidence that at least at lower doses, growth hormone can help with some of the negative effects of steroids. But, but the data really are limited and, and it's unclear uh, whether there are other benefits and it may vary from individual to individual. Um, I, I think we've beat the height dead horse here. Um, so looking at the weight, so you, um, when did, when did you stop being, when did you stop ambulating, Colin? Um, not till, actually, not till after 20, actually, so not till Ah, after okay. 20. Yeah. Okay, cool. Excellent. Um, so what do you make, so you started prednisone here at about 10, weight was going up a bit already. What, what do you, what was that about? Um, yeah, I don't, I don't really remember, um, I mean, that was so long ago now. Sure. Yeah, yeah. But then it distinctly rises quickly after starting prednisone. Yeah, um, yeah, definitely. And what was your motivation to make changes? Um, so really just knowing that, I mean, being, um, weighing less, um, good, I mean, good for over, uh, um, overall body health, but also, I mean, again, talking about for caregivers and um, parents with handling, if you're less heavy or easier to handle, and it's also just, again, good for um, overall health, less stress on your heart and such. Do, do you feel like there was a moment when you said, I'm gonna, this has got to change? Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, looking back, definitely. Um, um, my face was um, very puffy as well, so. Yeah. Um, you mentioned it that you you started metformin. Um, I just uh, I, I, but you also made huge changes, and you and I have talked about it. You you did a really impressive job uh, of changing your diet. Um, I I I I don't want I don't want people listening to get the impression that metformin is a magical weight loss drug. There, there's really very little evidence of that. Um, it's a complicated story, but there's not a lot of evidence that metformin is really that helpful in these kind of situations, although people prescribe it. Um, it can help though, um, especially helpful if people are also making changes. Uh, that's been demonstrated. By itself, it doesn't do much, um, but it seems to help get more weight loss if people are also making changes. Um, what I think is really impressive here is how you've maintained um, over the years. Um, and you and I have talked about this. You have a pretty disciplined lifestyle these days. Um, you you want to share some of that? Yeah, yeah. So um, a rule really for um, just having, when having like unhealthy stuff and definitely everything in moderation is good. So, I mean, I know um, people like to go out to eat, but um, we tried to limit that to probably at least once a week. And we haven't really been doing that at all yeah. um, during this pandemic, obviously, but um, yeah, and I just agree. Um, stay away from sugary foods and drink. Um, I would um, usually like only get soda or um, like lemonade on a special occasion, like when we go out to eat. So not having lots of that. And actually I, I really just stopped drinking soda and sugary stuff altogether. Um, I figure that's for, um, really just empty calories and figure, um, put my focus more on foods that I enjoy. Now I actually like, um, amazingly, like just like 
drinking water um, is my preferred preferred drink. Um, yeah. Good. Um, all right. I think so. I think we again. I think Collins' course here really illustrates many of the issues facing boys and families. Um, and I think we can sort of start opening up for questions. Do you have any final comments, Colin, before we um, address people's questions? Um, no, not that I can think of. I think, yeah, I think we can go proceed to that. All right, so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. All right. So I know I mentioned this at the top of the hour, but send us your questions, everyone. Um, there is a chat function. Just go ahead, type your question in, send it to us, and we will get through as many of these as we can. And I'm going to start at the top of my list. So this first question is for you, Colin. How old were you when you started the Met? Foreman, and can you share just a little bit about the experience of starting it? I know Dr. Zeitler was talking about how it's not a cure-all, it's not, you know, this magical weight loss drug, but it certainly can be helpful in, in that journey. Um, so maybe just share a little bit more about what it was like when you started it. Yeah, so I started that at um, age 15 when I um, when I switched over to the as well. Um, So maybe kind of hard to know which was necessarily uh, responsible for that weight loss because those were two pretty big changes at the same time, huh? Plus his lifestyle change. Yep. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So it was... Um, Did you have side effects? Did you have trouble um, with the metformin? Yeah, at first I did have some issues um, with um, diarrhea, and, diarrhea, but um, that resolved over time. But yeah, nothing too annoying. That is, that's pretty typical. Diarrhea is common. It usually goes away. Um, some patients can't tolerate it. It just, they just can't get rid of the diarrhea. Um, um, but you know. One of those things that's dose dependent, Dr. Zeitler? It, it is, but it's also unpredictable. Mm -hmm. um, some people can tolerate 2,000 milligrams. Other people can't get past 500. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's pretty, I'm not a big metformin fan outside of its use for, it's great drug for diabetes. Um, right. I don't think it's that fabulous in any other setting, but um, it's controversial. Yeah. One of those things that I think we recognize that we just want to know more information about it. And there's not, you know, a wealth of information as it pertains to Duchenne. And so um, that, that's certainly an initiative that PPMD kind of has in back of mind and just looking into um, its utilization and just growth and nutrition um, and yeah. weight as, as a whole too. So not necessarily just the metformin piece, but, but that whole clinical picture, it's certainly but, an important topic. You know, I think, I think the way that I noticed a couple of questions up is metformin a weight loss drug. The fact is that weight loss is kind of a side effect of metformin. It's not really what it's for right it's just a side effect and part of it is because people get nauseated and they lose their appetite um and the weight loss with metformin is about eight pounds i it's really not that fabulous i think if you know weight is clearly an issue in duchenne's there are better weight loss drugs um and and using metformin as a weight loss drug is probably ignoring much better options yeah, so, and really, um, I had also gone on to metformin um, for the um, insulin resistance. That's why I had a yeah. um, glucose test done. I, again, the evidence that it's beneficial for insulin resistance is limited, honestly. Um, it just, it somewhat is people feel like they need to prescribe something. Um, mm -hmm. But there are better options for all of these things, I, I think, that should be studied. And um, it's worth PPMD looking, looking at some of this. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 
And I think one of the messages that I'm hearing from the both of you as you talk about these topics too is if you yourself or if your son is having, you know, these these questions, if if these issues are coming up, this certainly would indicate a conversation with your endocrinologist to figure out what plan of care makes the most sense for you because the plan of care that Colin had might not necessarily be what's appropriate for the next guy. Um, and this is certainly complex and there's a lot of different layers too. So the next question is about steroids. And this is even a question that I was thinking about myself. So the question reads, what is your experience or professional opinion regarding the benefits of weekend dosing steroids versus daily in regard to height and weight? So I know that this is a hot topic. And again, one of those things that maybe we don't have a ton of data on, but, but what do you think, mm -hmm. Dr. Zeitler? I don't, I don't have enough experience to, to know uh, honestly, it, it, it is, makes some sense, mostly, mostly around the issue of adrenal insufficiency, um, that perhaps it would lessen the risk for adrenal insufficiency. Um, um, I don't, I don't know. I don't have the answer to that. I, I, I worry a little bit because the doses used are huge um, on the weekend. So, yeah. you know, and then you have these four days a week when you don't have any steroid around. And I just don't, I just don't know. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And um, if you're not doing daily, is that really getting you the benefit you need for taking it for Duchenne really? There's definitely some small studies. Um, I know that there's some really good work out of um, Dr. Ann Conley's group, um, but certainly something that probably would benefit just additional research, just larger cohort sizes. You know, some centers rely pretty heavily on weekend dosing and it's pretty normal for them. Um, I come from a center where we used it quite often and had a lot of really good luck with it and really great experiences. Um, but I know that other centers are very much pro daily dosing. Um, and then you bring in the, the concept of prednisone versus deflazacort and what data is available for weekend deflazacort. There really isn't any. So it's just so complicated. So not a straightforward answer there either, unfortunately. And I think that's kind of a common theme. Um, so Dr. Zeitler, this next question is for you. How soon would you recommend a child see an endocrinologist when he's on steroids? And when should a child receive hormone treatment? So I know we talked a little bit about testosterone last week, a little bit about growth hormone today, um, but, but what would you say? Well, I personally, I, I, my, my opinion is that, that any, any boy going on steroids should make, there should be a relationship established with an endocrinologist. Um, because you want to be sure that you've attain, obtained accurate height measurements, um, that you've got the history, um, you know, and, and just establish your relationship. Um, alternatively, you could rely on the muscle clinic to refer um, if the growth is not keeping up. Um, sometimes, they've got a lot on their minds and it gets missed for a while um, because they're dealing with so many other aspects of care. Um, so I think ideally um, in a perfect world, people would establish a relationship with endocrinologists as soon as they start steroids. I think we've seen a bit of a shift in this to be a bit more proactive with initiating those, those consults and, and, and those relationships. Um, I, I think, you know, even as evidenced in our most recent standards of care um, publications. Um, Colin, how old were you, if you remember, the first time you saw an endocrinologist? Um, that might be throwing it back a little ways. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I think I... Um, um, had seen one um, before um, we started going to Cincinnati in 2010, but um, yeah, I was. I think that, that endocrinologist um, wasn't really familiar with Duchenne, and of course, seeing the um, liver enzymes were high, he was 
concerned about that. But um, then when we started going to Cincinnati in 2010, so um, Dr. Rudder, who is probably um, a lot more or very familiar with Nushan, so yeah, I think it's definitely important to um, find a doctor that understands Nushan. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I think we're really grateful for the growing network of endocrinologists who are passionate about people with Duchenne and taking care of them. So we're certainly grateful for that. And then frame of reference, Colin, I've got a couple of questions that actually kind of pertain to um, your age, just as sort of like a frame of reference, if you wouldn't mind sharing. How old are you? I'm 25. 25. Okay. I was going to say somewhere in the 20s, but I know a couple of folks have had a couple of questions as it pertained to, pertain to that. Um, so this is an interesting question, and I'm going to phrase it to you, Colin. I don't know if you'll know the answer to this. I know if somebody asked me this question, I wouldn't know. Um, do you have any idea about how many calories you take in daily? Um, so I know um, the standard recommendation for um, color intake for a normal person is around um, 2,000 a day, but definitely it should be less than that. I mean, obviously we're less active being people using um, wheelchairs. So um, I think it was another of my um, friends with Duchenne had talked about, um, I guess I would say maybe like 1500 calories. And I, I, I'll expand that question to Dr. Zeitler. Um, I would assume, and my question for you is, is that something that you and or maybe a, a dietitian could help to um, calculate for someone with Duchenne yeah. if that's something that they're worried about? Absolutely. And I, I think it's a great idea to have formal interaction with a dietitian. Um, the, the problem is because of the decreased physical activity you can't really use standard recommendations. Um, right. So there needs to be an assessment of, of you know, is, is the boy ambulating, not ambulating, um, exercise, you know, what are they doing? Um, and then, you know, in a perfect world, um, getting a measure of resting metabolic rate, which can be done relatively easy in centers, would really give a, an exact um, amount of calories. And, and many kids with problems like Duchenne's have lower than expected resting metabolic rates. So their caloric intake may be lower than, than you might expect for someone their age and size. That's really helpful. I think kind of along the lines of that question, um, sort of, maybe a bit tangential, um, but Dr. Zeitler, what sort of just typical diagnostics do you recommend for someone with Duchenne? Um, I, I know that that changes depending on how old they are and what, what stage of life they're in, um, but maybe mm -hmm. just a quick overview for parents who maybe haven't seen an endocrinologist before yeah. and are just looking to understand what to expect. Sure, sure. So um, I, I think the way I think about it is um, that we, we know that that Duchenne's by itself is associated with slower growth and delayed puberty. So we know those two things, but you want to be sure that there isn't something else. Because, for example, hypothyroidism. Hypothyroidism is really common. And having Duchenne's doesn't protect you from getting hypothyroidism. Um, it runs in families. It's, it's very common. So you certainly would want to know if there was some fixable problem. Um, but I don't think it, I don't personally think it requires a huge evaluation. So what, what I would focus that evaluation on would be excluding things that you could pretty easily fix. So I would do thyroid tests. I would probably look for growth hormone deficiency because it can be done relatively easily. Um, with, an, with a test called an IGF-1, just to see if there's any evidence. Because again, if, if you could have growth hormone deficiency too, um, is it's relatively common. Um, so you'd want to know about it. Um, and a bone age, because I just think that's like a measurement, a very important piece of the puzzle. Um, beyond that, 
I wouldn't do a lot unless there was something in the history that drove me in a certain direction. Um, you know, is there any reason to think there's a kidney problem? Is there any reason to think that there's anemia or something? Celiac, for example, is another relatively common thing that can impair growth. So if there's some family history or there's something about the story that you're considering screening for celiac, but I think that's about it. Great, I think that that's really insightful. Okay, so the next question is about measuring height or length as it were. Um, so Dr. Zeitler, the question is, I'm wondering if you always use supine length or do you sometimes use segmental? So maybe talk a little bit about what segmental is um, and then um, maybe dive into your perspective there. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so segmental lengths, I mean, obviously, especially when, when boys get bigger and older, um, getting them out um, up on a table to do a supine length um, is annoying, at least annoying, if not more than annoying. Um, and, and so there have been efforts to try to figure out ways to uh, measure people um, by taking measurements of various segments of the body and then adding them up together. Um, the problem really is, I mean, that makes perfect sense. The problem really is that no one's ever really validated that, um, that you get the same result um, when you do that as you do if you get someone's supine length. Uh, we had actually attempted to do a study here looking at that where we convince the boys to like, okay, one more time, we're gonna do your length and do segments and then see if we could validate that. Um, and that's ongoing, we don't have enough numbers yet, but uh, that would be really nice to, to get around supine length. But right now it's the only really gold standard way to measure. So, so are you talking about like basis in segmental like um, using ulnar length to calculate height. Exactly. You know, using ulnar length to calculate height or femur length or, you know, are, is, is there a particular piece that's predictive? Um, the problem is steroids change spine height. I mean, there's so many things here that complicate just yeah. doing yeah. a regression of ulna against total height. So totally hear that. Um, in the clinic that I came from, we, we typically would utilize ulnar length um, because it worked really well for our respiratory therapists and it helped them to have good um, PFT readouts. And so it was sure. something that we very frequently do. But I remember distinctly one day we had somebody come in and say, you're doing it wrong. You need to be doing um, knee height. And we were like, what? What do you mean? We're doing it wrong. And they're like, oh, well, you need to do knee height. It's, you know, it, it's, it's a better value. And I was like, well, then what do you do with guys who have, you know, significant ankle contractures and, you know, there, there's, it, it matters. Right. And so it certainly becomes really, really complex. Um, yeah. And so I don't know, I guess I'm just echoing that sentiment, Dr. Zeitler, that it, there, there's nothing better than the gold standard, but we also kind of have Well, to it'd be nice. I mean, if you best. could get enough numbers so that you could sort of say, you know, you, you include the flazacort dose plus ulnar length plus, you know, something that would give you a, a height. Somebody, I just noticed somebody asked about arm span. It's a good question. Um, arm span theoretically is more or less the same as height, but it can vary by three to five centimeters um, from individual to individual. And so it's, it's reasonable. Um, we do it as a surrogate, but it's not perfect either. Absolutely. All right. I'm um, going to shift gears a little bit back to the weight piece. I know that we've got lots of questions, particularly about weight and metformin and weight loss. So apparently that's a hot topic we need to do some more digging and research on, which I totally appreciate. Um, and Dr. Seitler, you mentioned a couple of times regarding metformin not being great for weight loss, but that there maybe are some other options that are better. Um, could you talk a little bit about what some of those options might be and just some yeah. general considerations around those? 
Um, yeah, let me um, let me just I, I I neglected to mention one thing about metformin, and that is that, that there are a couple of studies suggesting that there may be benefits to the underlying disease with metformin. They're small studies, maybe. I mean, they're interesting. Um, I, I have had some families request metformin based on those studies, and the drug is benign enough that I said fine, um, but I, don't, I just don't know if we know that. Um, okay, in terms of other weight loss, there's, there's um, so for many, 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 many years, weight regulation was a big black box, um, but it's been effectively dissected. And we know a lot more now in the last five to seven years about what regulates both appetite and energy distribution, if you will. What's burned, what's stored. Um, a lot of this is uh, taking place in the hypothalamus. Um, and a lot of the components of the pathway that regulates this have now been identified. There are mutations, there are people that you, that you can find who have mutations in these things that cause obesity or, or failure to weight, gain weight. Um, and this is leading to drug development. Um, and there are increasing numbers of drugs that are actually targeted at uh, the appetite pathway, if you will. There's one about to be approved called setmelanotide. Um, it's being approved for a specific genetic mutation, but there's reason to think that it might be more generally useful. We'll see. Um, there is a drug called uh, liraglutide or um, Victoza. Uh, although it has a different name. It's also approved for adults for weight loss, but it has a different name for that purpose. And I forget, I forget what it is. Um, but it's, it's approved, it's a diabetes drug that at a higher dose causes weight loss. And so it's approved. And that's an interesting possibility because the drug class is also associated with reduction in long-term cardiovascular events in patients with diabetes. Would that be beneficial to overweight boys with DMD? Maybe. Um, it's worth considering. Um, there are other drugs like that um, that aren't yet approved for weight loss, but are being looked at. Um, a whole other class of drugs called SGLT2 inhibitors. Again, diabetes drugs, but, be, but they cause weight loss and they're being looked at as weight loss medications. And then there are the just real weight loss medications. And the most effective of these right now is a combination of two drugs called topiramate and uh, fentermine. This is marketed as Qsimia. It's very expensive. However, they're both generic and you can just take two drugs together. Um, and we've been using this relatively extensively in our obesity clinics, and it's very effective, much more effective than the former. So not been done in Duchenne's, and we'd have to think about whether there's any problems, um, but there are much more effective approaches to, to weight loss that, um, that may very well be usable. Yeah. Yeah, I would say definitely. Um, the, the main thing, um, the really important thing that helps is just having a healthy and well-balanced diet. That's the big thing there. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so one of the questions that is coming to my own mind, um, is there any pause in prescribing these types of drugs for adolescents with Duchenne or are these drugs that you would typically wait until adulthood? Um, I assume that their, their FDA approvals are probably indicated for adults, but maybe you could speak to that. Yeah, so they're, um, well, it depends on which drugs. Um, um, I, I think it depends on the severity of the situation. I mean, the fact is most drugs are not approved for kids um, and we use them anyway. Um, that's just a fact of life in pediatrics. Um, if you have a severe problem and, you know, as Colin says, weight lifestyle is critical. But if you've got somebody, say, whose obesity is really causing respiratory problems, um, et cetera, I, yes, I would be discussing 
these medications in an adolescent. Um, there's, there's not really any reason to think that that's not okay. Yeah. Yeah, and I would say um, the big thing is hopefully um, when we find other um, stored alternatives that don't have as many side effects, I think that will be helpful as well. I think it's just um, a fact of the, the steroids themselves. Yeah. It, it, it could be a completely different landscape. Yep, yeah. absolutely. All right, so this next question is my own. I jotted this down um, while you guys were presenting your slides earlier. And so Colin, I noticed that you started the growth hormone first, and then later on you started testosterone. So the question that I have, um, and maybe Dr. Zeitler, you can start us off, and then Colin, I'd like to hear your thoughts on this too. Um, I'm curious about the timing of the two drugs and if there is rationale in starting one versus the other. Um, you know, if you were to start testosterone first, would you potentially see some linear growth? Um, is there rationale in starting growth hormone first and then adding on the testosterone later? Um, what, what does that look like? Yeah, in general, it makes sense to start growth hormone first and then testosterone. Obviously, it depends on the, the clinical situation of what you're treating. I mean, if, you, if, you, um, if you've got a kid who's just struggling because of their delayed puberty and, and final height is not the issue, but they don't want to look so young in high school, maybe they don't need growth hormone. Um, maybe, like Colin said, really it was the testosterone that helped the self-esteem. Um, so that you don't look so young. Um, so I, I think it depends. That's individual, but in general, what you would want to do would be to get the growth increase with growth hormone before starting testosterone, because testosterone will mature the growth plates. Um, and so yeah. once you start testosterone, the clock is sort of ticking a bit. Um, yep. So um, it makes more sense to do growth hormone first. Yep, that totally makes sense. Colin, would you add anything to that? Um, no, but I would say, yeah, I was going to say that was why I did the growth hormone first, because um, Dr. Rutter had said uh, um, when, starting, when starting the testosterone, my growth plates would. Starts that clock. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All right. All right, so the next question that I have, and I know that we've kind of talked about this a little bit already, um, is there a good time to start growth hormone? Um, in this particular circumstance, um, the parent writes, you know, my son is 16. We also just started um, growth hormone this year. We're not seeing too many results, but we were curious if perhaps it would have been better to have started it sooner. So maybe Dr. Zeitler, you could kind of field that one for us. Yeah, it depends on so many things. It depends on the yeah. bone age. It depends on how far through puberty the, your, your son is. Um, it, it's a little hard, but in general, uh, in, in the earlier you start growth hormone, the more likely you are to get benefit just because you have a longer time to use it. Now, sure. if you're not getting any benefit at all, it doesn't matter how long you use it. Right, um, but if it's increasing growth velocity, the longer you have to do that, the, the better the outcome. Um, but certainly if you wait too long and the growth plates are almost closed, it's gonna do nothing. Absolutely, okay. So this next question is Colin, um, and then I'm gonna have one more closing question and then final thoughts from both Dr. Zeitler and Colin. Um, so Colin, do you think, and this is a really hard question, do you think that either the growth hormone or the testosterone helped you to maintain ambulation? I think that that's a question on a lot of folks' minds when they heard that you walked until 20. Um, so really, I think, I mean, I've always been kind of an outlier, um, um, different, or slower progression than most. I think that's just been, unfortunately, just really... Um, my specific case, and I don't think, yeah, I don't think really um, the growth hormone or testosterone probably um, noticeably had an effect on that. 
And yeah, I think I we would assume that that would make sense, right? Based on the research that we do have available on both of those drugs, we wouldn't think that that would have a significant effect. Um, and we know that every guy with Duchenne and or Becker is different. And the mutation has a lot to do with it and any modifying genetics and steroid use and height and weight. I mean, it's just, it's so complex, don't you think? Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's why I would say. Yeah. Hard to know. Hard to know, for sure. All right. So the last question, I think this is a really nice question to end on from our audience. So when going to the endocrinologist for the very first time, how best should a family prepare and what would you recommend they bring with them? Dr. Zeitler? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so in terms of what to bring with you, it, it kind of depends if you're seeing an endocrinologist within the same system that you've been having all your care in, in which case hopefully they have everything. Um, but the things that an endocrinologist wants to see uh, are growth charts. Um, that's critical and, and sometimes hard to get. Um, certainly any laboratory information um, that you have and any x-rays, bone age x-rays that, that you have um, would be important, again, unless they're already in the system that you're, that you're going to see the endocrinologist in. Um, so, so that's what you need to bring. Um, some family history, we're going to want to know family heights. Um, we're going to want to know, you know, is there a thyroid disease in the family? So ask grandma um, if, if there's thyroid in the family, um, things like that. Um, it's very handy to have some family history. Um, and then in terms of prepare, I, I think one thing is, you know, hopefully having a good sense of what growth should look like, um, like we just talked about and understanding the tools and what, what, what to look for. Um, and then I think having a very clear set of your own values, you know, is final height a value or not? Is, you know, having, having your son go through puberty at the same age as the other kids more of a value? Um, uh, what's, what's the important thing here uh, is, is really uh, important. And uh, because I think it's going to be very important when you have that conversation with the endocrinologist that, that it's not just focused on what the endocrinologist can do, because there's a lot of things we can do. Um, but what is it that we should do? in the circumstance. And that depends a lot on the values that, that your family is bringing to that conversation. Um, and that's very important. And I would, you know, keep your, keep your endocrinologist honest uh, around, you know, why are we doing that? Um, is, is that really necessary? Um, is it just that you're used to trying to get kids taller or is there some reason for doing this? Uh, I think those kind of Family conversations before you even go um, will will be important. Absolutely. And Dr. Zeitler, any final thoughts from you? Um, no, that was going to be so that helpful. was going to be my final thought. That was your final um, thought. Okay, perfect. <laughs> yes, yeah. which is you know this this is most of these treatments are not medically necessary. Um, obviously, treating hypothyroidism is, but stature, delayed puberty, none of this is medically necessary. Um, these are individual decisions made around quality of life, um, et cetera. Um, and, and just remember them and, and, and make sure you have that conversation with your endocrinologist with that perspective. Absolutely. I think that we should shout that from the mountaintops. Um, Colin, I would love to hear any final thoughts or take home messages that you want to share with our audience today. Um, well, I guess, I mean, Phil kind of said what, what I would say is, yeah, it's really comes down to personal decisions there, um, on your height and weight. So, yeah, um, yeah, I can't really, uh, can't emphasize that enough. So. 
Well, thank you so much, Colin. And thank you, Dr. Zeitler. I think that um, this was incredibly helpful. I know that I myself learned a lot and I think that everybody on the phone probably learned a lot too. Um, and it's just such a great opportunity to be able to pick your brains and, and ask you these questions about your personal experience and practice and, and, and what it's like living through, you know, growth hormone and testosterone and all of these different things. So, um, we can't thank you both enough for joining us today to close out this endocrinology series. It's been just fantastic. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and thanks to everybody for joining us today, um, to listen in. You all were incredibly engaged and asked awesome questions. Um, so I hope you find it um, helpful. For anybody who wants to go back and re-watch or re-listen, this is going to be recorded and archived on our website. So you can go back, you can re-watch their presentation from July from um, annual conference. You'll be able to re-watch this as well. Um, and if you have any uh, additional questions, feel free to send them to us. We can field them to Colin or Dr. Zeitler. Um, we keep them on speed dial. So we're super grateful to have them as part of our PPMD family. Um, so I think with that, you know, I know we're a couple of minutes past the hour, but again, thanks to our speakers and for everybody for tuning in. And that'll conclude today's recording. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye Colin.